Judge not, that ye may not be judged. That, more or less, is Matthew 7, a biblical text and supposedly a good piece of advice. Or is it? Hello, David McMillan here, former smuggler, once a person of interest, now simply a leper in the bygone world of international crime. Talking about, well, there's an awful lot of judging going on. And uh, what does it mean? Can we not judge? Judging, well, bias, determination, all things we shouldn't leap to do. But I've got to start from the very basic point that we are human beings and everyone alive today a survivor of generations and generations, thousands and thousands of years of making judgments and quickly. For if we had not, we would not be here today. Only those who could judge quickly lived. If you could not judge when you were about to be attacked by somebody or attacked by a predator, a lion, something less obvious, a slithering snake perhaps, you'd be bitten and probably dead, so you'd have no children. Only the children born to those who could make snap judgments and good ones at that are alive today, so we're programmed to do it. And probably a damn good thing if we sat around looking at the virtues of every situation. Well, such philosophers don't last long, do they? We know that. Is it a bad thing or simply unavoidable? Do we sit back later and think, well, that was a, a poor judgment call? But I want to bring it to you today from a really basic, visceral gut level. And I know that because of my long history in crime on the very fringes, in the depths. Where can I start? A little bit of the highs and lows, perhaps. A few snapshots, perhaps, for, uh, well, my qualifications. Let's see. 18 years old, having stepped away from everything that was in my civilized life, I found I had just enough money to go off and do some international mischief. I mean, not a penny to spare. So I was living in a disused warehouse. Mm. Illegally, too. Uh, it was not my warehouse. It belonged to the church or something like that. Mm. I had to be careful how I slept. I slept in a sleeping bag and kept my shoes nearby. The whole floor was covered in dust. Sometimes there'd be patrol cars going through the laneways outside. I'd have to creep out of my sleeping bag, gently slip on my shoes, and pad over towards the cracks in the tin and twisted metal and old glass of the front of this warehouse, and peer through the cracks. Was it safe? I had to judge. Should I do anything? Was I detected? It was the beginning of a lot of training in judgment. And where I was going, I'd have to judge things I knew nothing about. I found myself in countries that were particularly alien to me. That is, not part of my, well, shall we call it cultural heritage? I don't think so. But part of the things I knew about anyway. The people were not instantly recognizable by type, so I had to go from scratch. I had to make a lot of mistakes. That's the only way to learn. And I did. I trusted people who could not be trusted. I was conned, swindled. But I started again. I was very good at that. And what use was my history to me? Was it any use at all? Was what I was taught of any value? 
I don't think it was. I mean, imagine arriving somewhere and you've had a guidebook with a little bit of nonsense about the country you're entering into, whether it be, I don't know, in Asia, in, in Thailand or in India. Is it going to tell you something? I suppose if it was a, a Lonely Planet guidebook, it might say, oh, the people are friendly and happy, you know, but beware of um, unauthorized money changes. I mean, wh what kind of nonsense is that? It's not telling you anything you need to know. I need to know. <laughs> you know, sometimes I'd find myself in some strange jail, and um, even the voices were foreign to me. And I might snatch just a few seconds conversation with a fellow countryman, or whatever country I was pretending to be from. And in an instant, that person, if he sounded familiar, might sum it up. Don't trust the guys on landing three. You can go to the Turks, but they'll get you tangled up. The, the gypsies on the bottom floor, they're dangerous. These grabbed conversations on the landings and the corridors, they were passing on, <clears throat> certainly prejudiced, but nonetheless useful information. But none of that would really help me. I needed to know who was good and who was bad. After all, I didn't want to go back to some dusty warehouse, did I? Without doubt, everybody who alive today has come with some kind of a, a history from their parents, from their own city, or from the village they grew up in, some sense of their country and their people. Now, uh, their people might be at war with another group of people, and those people might be far away or, you know, within the same city. So there's uh, a lot of hard and probably wrong judgments there. But how does history fit in? I don't want to dwell on this too long. So let's just, uh, let's just see whether that's any use whatsoever. I mean, not just the guidebook, but all the inheritance of our history. Just a minute to think about it, huh? What have you inherited? We grow up taught some measure of history. The history of our kind, whatever that may be. And, like it or not, we will try to fit ourselves in there somewhere. A poet might wisely call it the past. A calm teacher might say simply, history. Someone who wants you to feel special will say cultural heritage. Be careful about those last. They will want you to do something of their personal ambition. Our history appears to settle in our minds from the written record. Yet only the winners of battle's words are preserved. The victor's history. And even then, written by their fans or ancient press agents. Leaders with absolute power are uncomfortable about history. Stalin didn't have sleepless afternoons worrying about it, and the Cambodian butcher Pol Pot tore it up, called his time Year Zero, and abolished money. Anyone with spectacles coming from a city was sure to be killed by the children Pol Pot raised. In the 1992 book, the End of History and the Last Man, Francis Fukuyama wrote that with the supremacy of Western liberal democracy came the end of history, the final form of human government. I doubt it, but we are certainly made to feel proud to be our own tribe, even if only just surviving and remaining outsiders. Which is better, to be proud as China, ancient and eternal, proud as Israel, having survived the unthinkable, though I suppose Japan feels the same, proud of the noble Spanish heritage, proud of a thousand years of English peace and relative civility, or proud to be new, brash, rich, and unconquerable in an often smug way. Yet, of what are we proud? What some dead people once did? 
And does it pass on an advantage in our lives, wherever it comes from, and however true or not it may be? My own history is, as I've said and recorded here before, a shoebox of old photographs. Sure, there's some sentiment in all that in a personal way, but it was never any use in making progress or better judgments. And if my ancestry was something else, something that began with an inherited hardship, would it make any difference? If I came from a tribe of green lepers, I'd certainly aim to be the exception. The green man you can trust. The leper from whom you can catch no contagion. But would anything of my tribe of dead people help me get further ahead or conquer those who wish me harm? No. Only what I learn from experience is of the slightest use. When it comes to happiness and success, history is an empty shoebox. Thank you for your cooperation. Well, there it is. Am I saying all the history that we inherit is a load of bunkum and nonsense and we should forget about it? Well, I don't think so. I, I must say I find the, the 5,000 years of what I'll call civilization, for want of a better word, is endlessly fascinating. I kind of would really like to time travel to, to get a sense uh, of what it was like. I suppose from having gone to countries unfamiliar to me, um, to go back to somewhere else and really get the smell of a, I don't know, smell of Rome 2,000 years ago. I mean, but that'd be entertainment really, isn't it? Let's get back to what you really need to take on and dispose of. After all, I ended up with some success. Yeah, sure, uh, through illicit and woeful trading in narcotics, I'd made a fortune. At one point in my early 20s, I had uh, one, five houses, a couple of apartments in the city. Some of them I'd hardly ever go to. I'd visit some of the townhouses and the, the penthouses, and just in the afternoon, grab 30 minutes fitful drug-induced sleep just so I could say I used the beds. I had cars, though I was not a big car fan, but mostly to play with them and change their engines. I really found quite quickly that the best thing you could do with money was to find the best things, by which I mean the most enjoyable things, the soft things, the most comfortable clothes, uh, the best soaps, it sounds small, but the best food, to not be troubled by anybody, to be able to disappear. The money allowed me to create new Davids all over the place, all over the world, each with its own house, furnishings, linen, clothes, papers for what they're worth. So I'd got the hang of it, is what I'm trying to say. I wasn't quickly going to go back to poverty. And what had I learned? What did I come to know that was of use, and maybe of use to you today? Throughout my career, I'd probably met about, well, come across anyway, at least 10,000 people. A lot of those people were criminals by virtue of the fact they were in prison. So. Where was my prejudice there? They were prisoners and probably could not be trusted very much. But I was looking for the exceptions. And we always are. Whatever prejudice we set out with, we hope to find the exception. Mm. i tell you one thing about uh, the wish to find exceptions. When we talk about people who dislike each other by uh, tribe or, or race, I could find no more astonishing example than somebody who was, um, he was, uh, it wasn't Macedonian, he was Serbian, that's right. He was Serbian and he was speaking 
the Croatians. Yes, the people his people hated most in the world were the Croatians. And yet they were all part of the former Yugoslavia, which was sort of held together by a, pretty much a dictator, Tito. But <clears throat> when that collapsed, when everybody surged for their own name on the, the world map, the fighting really broke out, and, and this tension between the, the closer tribes was great. This guy said, no, we were speaking in Australia. He said, uh, yeah, uh, I'm Serbian, uh, and I've come to Australia, and, and we were told that you're all idiots, and um, you, know, you can take advantage of the system here for one, and um, you know, hoodwink people for two, so we don't think much of you. Um, we don't count the uh, Chinese, don't understand them. Black people don't come into our lives, so it doesn't mean anything. Um, but the ones we really can't stand at a gut level are those bloody Croatians. Now, uh, what's going on there? Why this deep-seated stuff? I think it's just like the closest competitor is your greatest enemy. You see two stick insects, who are not quite the same uh, kind of stick insect, but they'll be boxing on, they'll be chewing each other's little spindly legs off. But they could walk past a mouse and think nothing of it. It's just too far different. Now, we don't have any prejudice, I guess, against other species. But I don't think that was always so. I think in the ruthless <laughs> red in tooth and claw, as they used to say, march of uh, evolution. Um, the Neanderthals were a bit too much like us, but certainly different from us. Well, sure, we've got, what, 4% Neanderthal genes, so there was some sex going on. But why didn't we like them? I think they sounded very different in their communication. I think there was something very distinctive about the way they communicated and spoke, and I've got a feeling, I don't know why, that they didn't even speak quite in the same way that we use language, the Homo sapiens, I mean. So that marked them out. And I suppose, uh, back then, they probably smelled different. Now, somebody who smells different kind of stands out. Do any amongst us smell different today? I think we've rather lost that ability. Um, you know, the um, African tribesmen said of Europeans when they first uh, came to Africa to uh, try and get themselves rich, they said the white man smelled like a wet chicken. But there you are, it's something distinctive to dislike, something to be aware of. White chicken. Eh. Oh, sorry, wet chicken. There you are, I've already put myself in it. I've attached color to it. Yeah. But all this stuff, it's no use. I found when I was in another country that I couldn't distinguish who was who without getting to know them. Now. Of course, I had to throw away um, all the ideas about, uh, well, I have to tell you, I'm well-traveled enough to know that color doesn't mean a damn thing. And I'll tell you why that is particularly. Because, <clears throat> firstly, I've been in parts of Africa where there are tribes there have somehow been isolated enough to keep their appearance through, oh, God knows how many generations that seem to have a little bit of everyone in us. Kind of a little bit Chinese eyes going on there, statues around the small of this tribe I'm thinking of. Perhaps somebody out there might be able to name it for me. But I almost got the feeling that these people went way back and that the distinctions that were formed later on all really came from this pretty small tribe. And, well, the DNA evidence rather does suggest that we started out as a, a kind of mm, a tribe possibly less than 5,000 people and then became the 7 billion we are today. 
with a lot going on. I know it's really hard to take on, but um, it, my feeling is it's likely to be true. And it's also true that none of that, interesting though it might be, is of any use. Certainly not to uh, a scoundrel running around the world trying to discern who is trustworthy and who is not. I would have to form some kind of relationship with them and do the usual tests. And what were they? And to do the customary things, start conversations which would reveal people's life ambitions, and then I'd earmark the ones that meant a lot to them, and um, hope to bring those into reality, their lifelong ambitions, by being loyal to me. Um, I was ruthless enough so that nothing really mattered other than that they did what I asked of them, and for that they would be rewarded. It sounds perfectly straightforward, but at some point you do reach what we'll call a friendship, where there is this agreement that you will help each other. How far? The further the better, and that takes a lot of learning too. But in my world then, Poor judgment had other consequences. I don't mean the technical judgment of uh, how best to run the network and uh, how best to uh, pack whatever it was I was smuggling, whether it be uh, in the early days gold or uh, uh, certain kinds of uh, machine parts, oddly enough, were quite profitable um, because they had a tax on them. But it wasn't the technical side of judgment that was difficult. It was the people. And I couldn't draw anything much from, I had to dismiss uh, their history, uh, as much as they really dismissed it anyway. So how best to move on? And through bad judgment, things in that business could change in the blinking of an eye. At one moment from, well, a 15 million pound uh, flat in Mayfair in London to a sudden turnaround and then a massive arrest in Australia. I found myself in a supermax prison. Everything I had destroyed. Where was my judgment? More than destroyed. Utterly ruined. People I loved dead. Every physical object taken or smashed. The supermax was particularly stripping of a person's past and history, of anything that's connected with you. I found myself in a, well, it was kind of like a, a suit that actually had a fastener in it that could be locked at the neck so you couldn't pass anything to anybody else. And, well, it had no pockets anyway, these kind of boiler suits. In a cell, it was entirely concrete, not one movable item in it, except perhaps the, the sink tap, steel, as was the toilet. The mirror built into the wall, steel, it wasn't real glass. The glass such as it was was two inches thick and almost unbreakable. The dry air from a kind of internal air conditioning system, sucking out even the faint smell that you might get from nature. Just nothing just the low hiss of the hydraulics that ran the doors. I would get glimpses of my past. I had to listen to some bug tapes that were in the, the old house, the big house with the swimming pool and all the good stuff. And I could hear the voice of my wife who'd been killed, walking about the house and living her life. But those sounds from a little tinny cassette player supplied by my lawyer for the case to listen to those recordings from the police were the only glimpse into my past, and I realized I had to dump it. So not only had I just got over dumping some prejudices, generally, about how people behave and what motivates them, but I had to dump my entire life to survive that, I had to strip it away to zero. And I mention this because 
somehow this is always a good starting point. I don't mean get yourself into such diabolical state that your entire life is wiped away, but just the mental state that you make no call. Of course, it is a filtering process. You start. You can't make a judgment without having a, a bad starting point. If we have a room full of people, there are men and women, is that going to make any difference to your ambition? Hmm? Largely not, but has to be said, the women who will help you or can help you because of their restricted lives will be less. Amongst the men, the men who are dominant in the society in which you are at that time, those dominant men are going to be the more powerful ones. They will most likely be an enemy. So you have to secure their cooperation. Whether they have some racial background or not is absolutely irrelevant. It will not help you. You can start with uh, saying, I don't know, um, all people of um, Asian heritage are going to be cunning in business. But that's not necessarily so. They, they can be as, as sentimental as the next person, often more so, more subject to embarrassment. That's something to take on. You can carry your prejudice, if you're white, to black people, but what the hell does that mean anyway? It's a useless term. There are none. Nobody is actually black, for a start. Secondly, there are dozens. And if I, if I try and run them through my mind, I can think of interesting uh, and, and rather unique uh, physical characteristics that could generally apply to, say, people from uh, North... Um, East Africa, uh, Somalia, um, Eritrea, um, compared to people from the other side of the country. I mean, there's such a, a wide mix. It's, it's not going to do you any good, and it's certainly irrelevant. And if you don't get rid of it, you just get tangled up. If, if for example, you, you say, I'll only deal with my kind. Remember, you're going up against your prime competitor. Often it's not you're better to go for help from somebody who is a bit of an outsider or an outlier, as they call them sometimes. That's often a good starting point. One of my oldest friends from those old days was Lee, my Asian fixer and... Uh, helper of all things there. And, and I met him, and he was living in, um, well, near poverty, really, in a kind of shanty town in Bangkok. His background? Well, kind of mixed. He had spent some time in South America, and I, I rather took him somehow for having looking a little bit South American. But in fact, some of his family came from... Um, what is Bangladesh today, and others from over bordering Afghanistan. So, you know, he, he spoke about five languages, uh, I guess, I'm thinking all with an accent, actually. And the reason we formed a friendship, because he felt like a, a bit of an outsider, too. He was a driver, a chauffeur around town. He earned a bit of a living... Um, <clears throat> with a few foreigners that had visited the city. He, he'd send them bits of dope in the mail. Uh, you could get away with it in those days. But he, you know what it was? Lee was looking for somebody he could trust. And sometimes you meet somebody and you can sense that, that here is somebody who's been treated badly for a long time, but looking for somebody he can trust. Now, like them or not, and your senses should tell you if you like that person, if they radiate that yearning to be trusted and to be able to trust somebody else, that's the key to it. You can find that really anywhere. Now, 
bear in mind, I came from a um, some training that was actually kind of ruthless when it comes to assigning people in categories. When I was in advertising, uh, this was for an American company, Macy's, their psychological division, you could call it, broke people down into, I don't know why, 12, it always seems a popular number, not just in astrology, but almost with everything. Of course, it's connected to moon phases and things, but so what? You can find a number connected to anything if you want. Anyway, they had 12 types of people, and uh, th those types would be attracted by different kinds of approaches in advertising. Was there any useful information in this? Could I, I take uh, the ad agency's 12 people and draw anything out? No. The... Um, hmm. Well, they'd got their uh, information from the Psychological Warfare Department. The sum of it was only that they needed to be treated differently, these 12. And they did have physical characteristics, it must be said. And I suppose, I don't think the number would be 12, but we could start dividing up people from all around the world into types. Mm. I, there's no point to what I'm saying today to start listing them. But what I'm getting at is, I don't know, if, if you've been to school in the West, you'll all remember the, the kids in the class. And there might be a type which was the chubby kid with small hands and seemingly small eyes, um, who was a bit dense. Um, now, that that was a type because there's more than one of them. Or there'd be the the skinny tall one that had a rather odd high-pitched voice that was another type amongst the girls there'd be the uh, um, blonde chubby one who seemed to be of loose morals or the aloof one uh, with long black hair um, and I think the division of 12 was just as artificial as any I did it as an exercise once, and I, I seemed to come up with about 60 um, types of people who could loosely be put into a group. But actually, very little of that um, is of any use. Um, we did have a bit of a game when we were in prison to try and spot the people we thought were sex offenders. Mm. Only trouble is, when we cross-checked uh, the background files, our guesses were usually wrong because there's so many different kinds of sex offenders. There were the rapists who um, like to prey on a particular kind of woman um, so that they could... Well, they got off on the fear. Uh, somehow that was erotic to them. But that was one type. Uh, and there'd be other, well, we saw them as more animalistic who would just fuck anything, really, and didn't care how they did it. But that was definitely a different type of rapist. So you, you couldn't really uh, pick the, the sex offender terribly well. And which mm, all our jail experts there were a bit disappointed that we couldn't. Uh, though there are some, again, and I really haven't got time to draw out their characteristics or trawl through some web photographs to kind of find the type. But, uh, gosh, you only really have to look at um, those convicted of uh, predatory uh, child sex offences, and some of them, about, what, <clears throat> at least a third, maybe a half, will have a kind of particularly malformed look about them. Um, an evil look? No, but a very mutant look. Now, this could be an illusion too, after all. Um, a lot don't get caught, and so the mutant look is probably on the idiot who doesn't take uh, a lot of precautions to, to cover up what he's doing. So that could sway the effect of saying that this type uh, is more likely to do such and such because we're judging on those who got caught doing it, which adds another layer of cretinism to the, the whole thing. So uh, 
God, well, really what it is, even at things you'd think there would be some type for, when you strip it away, there's no actual useful information. Let me be even more frank in a way. Speaking as a an old grey-headed white man, if I pick something that would have had um, a great distance from my upbringing, say I, I wanted to go to some place where the reputation was poor, let's say, I don't know, a market in Casablanca or, I don't know, uh, Kinshasa in Africa. Now, how am I going to figure out who to trust there? Already I know that I'm going to stand out. And where do I go? Do I, do I trigger a series of little tests and go through? Hmm. I don't know. After meeting so many people in so many different parts of the world, there are some little bits of body language that kind of tell you something. But it won't be the superficial stuff. Not at all. There are some people, though, it doesn't matter of what colour, what background or race, who look stupid and are, in fact, stupid of any kind. But it's not confined to countries. You've got to allow for <clears throat> opportunity and um, <clears throat> well, the effect of generations on um, favouring the crooked. And that can't be a good thing. I mean, sometimes it can be beneficial. It is clear that the Ashkenazi Jews, for example, um, seem to have a slight, it's, I think less than 4%, but a slight IQ advantage. And here we have to accept that the usual ways of measuring IQ are of any value, but the uh, number of Nobel Prize winners who have uh, Ashkenazi Jewish heritage is disproportionately high. But then again, we've got to factor in um, uh, quite a few very obvious things that um, if you come from a society that has been uh, preyed upon, subject to pogroms and you know, attempted genocides, the survivors among them would have to be pretty sharp, I guess. So their children would get some of their genes and be sharpish too. But also, here, the Nobel Prize and the scientific life is, it, it favors, um, favors people throughout a kind of uh, family line and, and geographical opportunity. So opportunity and um, is really a huge thing. It shouldn't be dismissed, uh, being in the right place at the right time. Look at all those people born of, uh, say, Bill Gates' generation. If you look them up, there's a, a surprising number of, or disproportionate number of uh, billionaires for those born in the early 50s. Uh, and you can work it out why. I think uh, a few people have written about this. Uh, was it Noah Hariri, Malcolm Gladwell? Anyway, you can dig it out. But these other factors um, don't really help you if you're a scoundrel who needs hard answers and knows to be able to uh, trust and assess somebody very quickly. When I was in Bangkok and Thailand and facing the death penalty, I needed somebody who could arrange a passport for me. And it was pretty clear soon enough, and I knew that world well enough, that it wouldn't be um, a, a Thai necessarily. It was more likely to be a, a Thai Chinese because they were very good at the kind of uh, clandestine uh, business world of secret money and they handled their documents well. Is this a prejudice? No, it's simply a fact. 
but you see, you can't draw the wrong conclusions there. You you can't say that uh, that well by that standard the the ties themselves, the more traditional ones, are all bunglers and hopeless cases who can't keep their mouth shut. <clears throat> well, do you gain some advantage by stripping away that lot? Frankly, you do. You can make a broad judgment to save yourself some time, and you may be wrong, and you might have to start again. But um, if you point yourself in the right direction, you're still going to have to come to know that person and find the exception. Now, uh, I found uh, Charlie, and did I know I could trust him so much? Did I know that he would have a passport ready for me after I'd escaped, and that it would have all the correct stamps and markings and be on the uh, airport uh, computer system? I'd hoped so. I wouldn't be here telling you this if... Uh, if he had not done everything perfectly. But it was getting to know him that mattered. And it sounds, and I've said it before, you have to really like humanity to have this work. It's not a matter of simply putting aside a prejudice. You have to kind of dive into your prejudice to swim through it, as it were. Um, now, I'm not saying you're looking for exceptions, but you're looking for somebody you can trust, so you have to know them as a person. You have to be interested in their lives and their welfare. It's no good. You can't, you know, a lot, a lot of con men try to uh, use people, and they think they get to know them and look for weak spots. But more often than not, they fail. And... There is kind of single-use uh, friendships that they form. And it's a peculiar thing with con men that I'll go into in another talk, that they actually <clears throat> thrive and get a, a gambler's thrill from um, deceiving somebody and, and knowing that that person will discover it. They're, they're not happy, the true con man, unless he knows that you're going to find out and feel terrible. Odd. Hmm. But still, they, they don't get to know anybody because they're not actually capable of liking something. Uh, liking somebody in a way of, well, broadly, loving humanity. If you're bitter about humanity, you will never really succeed. And this is beyond simple prejudice. If you're not willing to absorb something about other people, you get nowhere. And if you go into anything dangerous, you'll fail. And you wouldn't be available to be interviewed by me. And I wouldn't hear your stories. Those asking for signed books tell me some extraordinary things. I suppose they tell me because I'm a bit like a being so dark, knowing that their secret is safe with me, because I've had a lifetime doing it, knowing that I'll never judge because I've been an outsider for so long. Also in um, Thailand, I had the, the novel experience of um, being seen as uh, inferior by virtue of being white, and thought of as white trash for some time until they got to know me and being in chains and being treated badly uh, presumptively that if you were a white man in a Thai jail you must be scum and that's how the other Thai prisoners saw just about all of the white people me included so, was this the equivalent of uh, being, say, <clears throat> a black man in the southern states a hundred years ago? No, no. Though I could have been there for 20 years and died, um, so it would have been a long time. But I did have the advantage that I had a really <laughs> most 
pleasant and happy childhood. I think it would colour your life, to use a, a poor comparison, um, by having from the outset something heavy put on your shoulders. You know, I suppose this comes to another point. I'm trying to advise about seeing through everything, um, getting to to know people, even if whatever your business is, because ultimately, criminal or not, it's a matter of trust, but you have to care about somebody before you'll know them. You can't pretend that. If you're a born scumbag, and there's a few weak, fearsome little creatures who are, your life will be miserable because you don't care about anybody else. Sure, there's a danger of caring about others that you will be betrayed from time to time quite often and let down. But you should be big enough to be able to absorb that. In essence, you have to have the strength to be able to take on the weight of somebody else's problems. To be allowing yourself to step into their lives, whatever it might be, and everything else will not help you. But here's something else that's going on about judgments at the moment. People are tying themselves up in knots about past injustices and their legacy and how they should behave today. Well, here's something worth knowing. I'm old enough now to have seen waves of injustice thrown about, both general, personal, pretty much everywhere, and been well, truly passionate as a very young man. In my teens, I wanted to tear down the world. I thought everything was wrong and unjust. I remember even reading um, uh, the female eunuch, Jermaine Greer's book, and I think I was only about 15 at the time, but I, I remember thinking, wow, I'd never really uh, seen it that way. What a, what a shit end of the stick women get. God damn it. Uh, no wonder I don't understand them, I thought. But I was pretty much ready to dive into any cause and go the whole hog. Um, I went to school back in those days in Australia, and I... I often thought, um, hell, if I was an Aboriginal Australian, I probably would think, kill Whitey, kill every last one of them, because their history was kind of bad. But I would have also thought, too, that this is <laughs> something that only a teenager gets uh, knotted up over. And I think there's kind of a lot of very youthful um, twisting around it. A past goes away. It really does. I don't have any long-term legacy from being chained. I put the torture, that was a different thing. You have to put that in a kind of a little box, that one. And I was damn lucky it wasn't long-term because I... That's the end of you. You're finished. You're never the same. Oh. Uh, so I had a bit of luck there. But lots of miserable shit things have happened. and hasn't made any real difference to me. I'm still the same kind of optimistic person I was at 12 years old when I wanted to go into space. Um, I was really happy then, too. But the point is, I think some people end up with the wrong chemistry and they're miserable fuckers anyway. So uh, they're always going to be blaming something else or somebody else. Or really by proxy taking on causes that really don't matter. But it's a good thing to have a cause. It's, it's a great thing to feel passionate about something, even if you're a teenager and a half-wit. It's a great rush. But if we take the long view... It will all be gone within a few generations. Yes, what is it, the, the last natural blonde will be born in 50 years' time? 
and it just won't be any more after that. The the slow mixing and shift of uh, uh, worldwide uh, ability to travel and marry people who are exotic to us, which is quite a healthy thing to do, really. Apparently, I'm more protected from disease by mixing of the genes, so I wouldn't fret too much about that. Um, but the the fact is that uh, I suppose in uh, a few hundred years, the only reason we'll look a bit different by well, kind of like type will be types that we've invented. Yes, we'll be designing uh, not only our own children's looks, but probably um, have the ability to change our own features. What will we look like? Mm, I don't know. I would think I'd like uh, a kind of, well, hell, I like uh, 40 years off my age for a start. Um, complexion, mm, a little more on the coffee side, I'd say. Like a, what Whitey would call a healthy tan, uh, what somebody else might say was uh, proudly of mixed, whatever that means. Right. You know, mixed race, we're all mixed race, frankly. If you look at the genetic diversity of every every single one of us, with a few excep exceptions, um, we've got genes from everywhere. And I'll tell you what, the, the ones that don't have genes from everywhere are usually very prone to certain kinds of cancers and, and inherited diseases. So, uh, <laughs> racial purity of any kind is not a ticket to good health, uh, that's for sure. But here's the thing, uh, Fukuyama was probably uh, wrong on several levels, but is it the end of history? It, to some extent, there, there just won't be um, the huge troubles that there, there are around the world, and certainly not the great causes in a few hundred years' time, especially as um, people um, prolong their good health until they're 120, and then in the next great leap are able to actually um, freeze the, the decay of the telomeres in our cells, which is the things that age us as they die off, uh, so that you can get to the age of 35 and stay that way kind of forever. Um, the great hurdle in doing that um, as we speak is that if you um, stop programmed uh, cell death, apoptosis it's called, uh, you encourage cancers like wildfire. So uh, it's one thing to have your tongue replacing its cells or, or the the skin cells on your hand, which by necessity um, keep replacing themselves, it seems, just about forever. Um, it also could trigger runaway cancers, so that's just a, a technical aside to living forever. But you can imagine just even, even a few hundred years, will it be a very drab world? Mm. With no passion, no causes, nothing to get all hot and bothered about. Yeah, I suppose it will be, uh, but it won't, because we're inventive little buggers, and we'll come up with very interesting entertainments. And you know what? Some of those entertainments will be traveling in a simulated past for the experience of times of huge injustice like some kind of sick tourist, I suppose. And to do what in your simulated jump into the past? <laughs> but you don't think that's going to happen, I'll tell you. Do you know why we haven't heard from um, alien uh, intelligent civilizations in other galaxies? Yeah, sure, there's the distance and the, the youthfulness. Well, it really is quite young of the universe. Uh, well, the universe we can see. But th the other reason is that they don't bother to come and see us or even send a probe because they're so advanced. Uh, their entertainments are all simulated. Yeah, and they don't bother to travel. 
And we don't even go to the cinema anymore. We've got huge TVs in us. <laughs> yeah, it's our entertainments will be very enclosed, and of course the great injustices will be gone. You look at all the dystopian sci-fi future movies showing some future world that's all terrible and divided and um, what was that um, um, alternate carbon or something altered carbon I think it was uh, in that society um, of this fiction the future had uh, the great rich who were able to um, put on new sleeves or new bodies at will but also there were the the regular poor drones down there somewhere. This division of society is very unlikely to be the case in 500 years. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I won't go on speculating about all that here. I'll do that someplace else and better. But I tell you what, I said it about lockdown. When it's gone, you'll miss it. And when it comes to injustices that you can get worked up over, when they're gone, you'll miss them. You just won't feel passion about anything. And I must say, at 64, I look on uh, a lot of the people on both sides, really uh, getting themselves worked up one way or another. And they're not really taking the long view. And I've seen it all before, and repeated in wave after childish wave. So, to kind of wrap this up, coming from somebody who's learnt the hard way by making just about every possible mistake there is to make, and whose judgments had to get better in the end just to survive. Don't do anything because of your ancestry in any sense. It really doesn't matter a darn. Shouldn't use strong words there, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> when your cultural inheritance, yeah, I suppose it's the thing. <clears throat> It's not much of a thing, though. Absorb it, know it, never act upon it. My God, you've got better things to do. You're looking for happiness. You're looking for success. And you're looking, most of all, the ability to judge someone else so you can predict what they will do and how true to you they will be. That's all that counts. And you'll only get that by seeing deep enough within and with an open heart. Now, you could be rather ruthlessly using that information or with kindness. But I find for all the portrayals, kindness is not such a bad thing. And I tell you what, it's a very great help with digesting your food and for a good night's sleep. Bitterness and anguish interfere with those most basic things which we should hold high above everything else. Good food and restful sleep. When you find yourself getting passionate about anything, put the past aside. It's probably all wrong anyway. <laughs> and if you were there on the spot, you'd come away confused. No. Judge really everything upon which you will take some real action against that great goal of a good night's sleep and some fine eating. You won't go too far wrong. And save your snap judgments for the food on your plate and that pillow under your head. Good night.